That's what you are. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming out this afternoon to celebrate the life of Palea Joy Smith. We declare that all human life is precious, is made in the image of God, and is to be treasured from conception all the way to the elderly to end of life stages. We declare that all human life is precious because the word of God makes that declaration. The prophet Jeremiah wrote of how God called him and when God called him into service. And he writes this in Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. All human life is precious, regardless 
of how long or how short their lifespan may have been. All human life is made in God's image, and we are here today to celebrate the precious life that is Palea Joy Smith. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you today with heavy hearts. We know that you are good. We don't doubt that. We know that you are right and that you are powerful in all that you do. And yet, Lord, we know that this world is broken and it's most evidently shown to us today as we mourn the loss of such a young infant. So, Lord, meet with us. Encourage us with the truth from your word. Help us to mourn and to mourn well. Help us to heal. We'll give you the praise and thanks for how you will work in us today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to read for you from the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 18. Paul writes these words. He says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. I 
take things I wanted to show you. Sing sweet lullabies, wipe your teary eyes. Who could love you like this? People say that I am brave, but I'm not. Truth is, I'm barely hanging on. There's a greater story. Long before me, because he loves you like this. I will carry you while your heart beats here, long beyond the empty cradle through the coming. I've shown her photographs of time beginning, walked her through the parted sea, angel lullabies, no more teary eyes. Who could love her like this? I. At the end of October 2023, Sonia and Bernice discovered that they were going to become parents. The pregnancy had its difficulties, but also had its joys. When Sonia felt the flutterings of life inside her, she was overjoyed and loved sharing these moments with her husband, Bernice. Every ultrasound appointment, little baby Smith was always on the move. However, due to medical complications, Paleo Joyce Smith joined the world early at 25 weeks on March 10, 2024. Her fiery, spunky spirit was evident as she continued her constant movements in the NICU at Methodist Women's Center. As her NICU doctor would say, she was kicking and throwing punches during her cares as they did all they could to help her grow and get stronger. Despite her strong spirit, her body was weak. On March 16, 2024, around 10 p.m., Palea passed away in her parents' arms and went to the arms of Jesus. Palea was and will continue to be the light and joy of Bernice and Sonia's life. 
She is extremely loved by family, friends, and the NICU staff. May her fiery light always shine bright with love. Palia was preceded in death by her grandparents, by her grandfather, Bernice Smith Sr. She is survived by her parents, Sonia and Bernice Smith of Harlan, Iowa. Grandparents, Scott and Billy Phipps of Harlan, Iowa. Octavia Smith of Georgetown, South Carolina. Her aunts and uncles, Amethyst Phipps, Josh Gozer, Anthony and Carrie Smith, Terrence and Sophia Smith, and Brian and Latoya Orfield. I have a poem that, that Sonia gave me to read for you now. We never had the chance to play, to laugh, to rock, to wiggle. We long to hold you, touch you now, and listen to your giggle. She'll always be your mother, and he'll always be your dad. You will always be our child, the child we never had. But now you're gone, but yet you're here. We sense you everywhere. You are our sorrow and our joy. There's love in every tear. Just know our love goes deep and strong, that we'll forget you never. The child we had, but never had, and yet will have forever. Surrounds in deepest waters, you saw. 
We're going to sing <clears throat> You Are My All in All. Please stand the singing. <clears throat> strength when I am weak. You are my treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up might be a cruel. You are my all in all. Jesus, sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus. be seated. It's our goal today to be an encouragement to Bernus and Sonia and to the rest of the family. It's our goal to, as a body of believers, as friends and family, to be that support system that we're supposed to be. In this moment right now, though, I want to take us to the Word of God so that we can hear from God. Because that's how we hear from God, is to use the Scripture, to, to read it, and to allow the Spirit to take those truths and to convince us of their veracity, to convince us that they are true and real and how we can use them in our lives. So I want to take us this morning, this afternoon, whatever it is, to John chapter 11. So if you have a Bible, if you've got a phone to pull it up, the text will be up on the screen in a little bit when I get there. Uh, but John 11 is the story of Lazarus. In the first part of the chapter, um, Jesus is with his disciples. Now anyone who, who followed Jesus is someone you'd call a disciple, but he's with the, those 12 special disciples. One of them was less special. And you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Even though he only had those 12 close followers, even one of them was a devil. And that is shocking, isn't it? That's not for today. That's for some other time. Jesus, Jesus lived on earth for a little over 30 years, had an active ministry for the last three years of his life, and he spent a significant amount of time with these 12 disciples. At the beginning of John 11, he's with those 12 when he receives word that his good friend Lazarus is deathly ill. And rather than jumping up and getting in the car, getting on his sandals, getting over there to be with the family, to even heal Lazarus, what does he do? Those of you who know, what does he do? He waits. Days he waits until Lazarus has died. And then he proceeds with his disciples to go and console Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha. And that's where we pick ourselves up here in the text. John chapter 11, I'll begin reading in verse 17. John 11, verse 17. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb 
four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. The first thing we see in our text is that there is a foundation of truth that we need to have. On coming into town, Jesus has this touching conversation with Martha. And in that conversation, he draws out of her some compelling, important theological truths that, that Jesus does this to, that it, in, in a means to comfort and to encourage Martha in her very profound grief. The truth that Martha knows that Jesus gets her to clearly state has everything to do with who Jesus is. When you come to earth-shaking trouble, like the death of your child, your grandchild, your dear little niece. When you come to earth-shaking trouble, knowing Jesus is the foundation, well, man, that holds everything together. Knowing who Jesus is, that's the first step. And here's what Martha confessed as truth regarding Jesus. The first thing that she said is verse 21 of John chapter 11. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. The first thing that Martha expresses as her truth, her understood truth of Jesus is that Jesus is powerful. That if Jesus had been there, that he could heal any sickness, any weakness. Martha knew that Jesus had the power over everything. How did she know this? Well, because Jesus had healed people countless times. All within a, just two or three years. The deaf could hear. The blind could see. The crippled walked. This sickness that took Lazarus was no match for Jesus, and Martha knew that. Martha knew that there was nothing impossible for Jesus. In fact, she doubled down, doubles down on that truth in the very next sentence. This is verse 22. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Martha very clearly expresses her faith that if Jesus would ask the Father to bring back Lazarus, that he would do it. You know, those who do not know Jesus go through hard times just like everyone else. The inverse is true, too. Knowing Jesus doesn't mean you don't go through hard times. Anyone who tells you otherwise is a liar of the cruelest form. Believe in Jesus, the charlatan cries, and you'll never run out of money. Believe in Jesus and you'll always be healthy. Believe in Jesus and your baby won't die. None of that is true, right? Some of you are shaking your head. None of that is true. Believing in Jesus doesn't mean you don't have hard times, that you don't face struggles. None of that's true and none of it is found in the Bible. And none of that is the true experience of real believers. The Bible makes it clear both in direct instruction as well as the experience of real people recorded in Scripture that life is hard. Right? 
There are days that we know it, and there are days that we really, really know it. That life is hard. Everyone experiences pain and loss. But those who have a foundation of the true Jesus, the biblical Jesus... They have a security and assurance that the world just cannot know. Now, in our passage, Jesus knows what he's about to do, okay? In fact, he basically tells Martha, your brother's going to rise, and and, and she doesn't understand that he means today, in a few moments. But she doesn't understand, and that's okay. Jesus doesn't correct her misunderstanding. Jesus knows what he's going to do, but rather than just do it, he brings this truth out of Martha first for her sake. So let's continue. Beginning in verse 28, we see a purpose in mourning. When when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, And the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? In these verses, we see Mary confessing the same truth that Martha did. Let's notice in verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Scripture said that Jesus was troubled. Some English translations say that Jesus was angry or some other form of being greatly agitated. The New Testament was originally written in the common Greek language, the language common all throughout the Roman Empire at that time, and that word that is used here means to be indignant. Being indignant is being angry because something is not right. There's all sorts of shades of anger, aren't there? But when something is just not right... That's a special kind of anger, and that's what Jesus has here. Everyone knows that death is not right. The fact that anyone ever dies is unmistakable proof that the world is broken, that it's not right, and we all know it. Sure, we accept that death is part of life because everyone dies. But just because death is part of our collective experience does not make it right. Jesus is standing, in, this, in the, these verses, he's standing with the grieving sister of his very good friend, and he expresses his disdain at death. The purpose in our mourning, in our sorrow, is to point us to God to draw our hearts to the time when God will make everything right. The wisest man to ever live apart from Jesus himself was Solomon. He wrote in Ecclesiastes 7.2, a verse that many of you are familiar with, perhaps too familiar with. Ecclesiastes 7.2, It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. What he's saying is it's better to come to a funeral 
than to go to a party. Parties are fun. This isn't fun. But coming here reminds us that our lives also are short. Pelia's passing gives us great clarity about the brokenness of this life. I hate it, and so do you. I know you do. John eleven thirty five 35 is a famous verse for a variety of reasons, one of which is because in the English translation, it is the shortest verse in the Bible, and it makes it one of the kids' favorite verses to memorize. You know it as well as I do. Jesus wept. Many have written much about why it is that Jesus wept. And I will tell you that I kind of think of that as a waste of paper. Why did Jesus weep? He wept because he was sad. We don't need any further explanation. He grieved because it was right. Because his friend died. Because he's standing there with the survivors who are weeping and in that culture wailing. It's unsettling to be around someone who's crying. It's very much unsettling to be around someone who's wailing. Earlier in the passage when I said that there were Jews with, her, with Mary in the house weeping with them. That, that's what they would do. They would get together and they would wail at the top of their lungs expressing their sorrow. And Jesus is experiencing that and he misses his friend and he feels for his surviving friends and he grieves. Grief is normal. Grief is right. Too often we want to skip grief and head to the comfort. And I mean, that's a normal desire also. But grief is right. Grief is expressed many ways, not just through tears. Grief can show itself as anger or guilt. Grief can manifest itself in someone's life as, uh, as numbness, not feeling anything or, or not knowing what to feel, how to feel. Grief can show up as denial or depression or, or any other number of ways. And what you're going to see is your grief is going to increase and it's going to decrease. It's going to ebb and flow. It will hit you hard some days, seemingly out of the blue. And other times it will, grief will hit you because you've actually been feeling fine for a while and then you feel bad about feeling good. There's not a lot of logic to it, but that's how grief works. Grief is normal, and it is a right response. And Jesus, God the Son, experienced and expressed grief. Even when he knew that Lazarus was going to be raised very shortly. Grieving does not mean that you are somehow failing to trust the promises of God. There's another way that grief can show up, a feeling of helplessness. Now, we might feel that. We do feel that from time to time. That's one form of grief Jesus did not feel. He was not helpless. Jesus is God. God is never helpless. And in our passage, Jesus is about to demonstrate that he is all-powerful after they proceed to the tomb. So we're going to continue. We can't stop here. Verse 38, now we've, we've seen that Jesus is the foundation of our truth and our hope, that there's a purpose in mourning, that it points us to God. Verse 38, then Jesus deeply moved again. There's that word indignant, angry. Deeply moved again, Jesus came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a sto stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? 
So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen straps, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Everyone was in such shock that no one thought to unbind him and let him go. Jesus had to tell him, tell them, take care of him. He's alive. Jesus did it. He spoke and Lazarus came back to life. He took what was wrong, what was broken, and he made it right. Jesus proved the biblical doctrine of the resurrection from the dead that is, that is appointed at a yet future time by raising Lazarus. Jesus foreshadowed his own death. That was only a few days away at this point. He foreshadowed his own death and resurrection that we look forward to celebrating in just one week. And because Lazarus was raised and because Jesus was was raised, we too have confidence that Palea will be raised, as will all believers of all times be resurrected to life eternal, to always be with the Lord. I can't wait. I'm going to back up a few verses to verses 25 and 26, where Jesus had asked Martha a very pointed question. Here's that question. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? The question is, do you believe? Do you believe like Martha that Jesus is the Messiah? The promised one, the only perfect son of God who was slain as the sacrifice for our sins. Do you believe? Do you trust in Jesus alone to make you right with God so that you can live for him now and with him forever? Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life and that anyone Everyone who believes in him, though they die physically, yet they shall live eternally, forever with the Son. Palea Joy, PJ, entered the joy of her Savior just one week ago. She has only ever known God's goodness and delight. That's the goodness of our Savior. Taking those who could never understand themselves to be with him. Do you know this Savior? Are you trusting this Savior? Let's pray. Lord, our sorrow remains. yet not forever. Our pain is heavy. Our grief is real. Yet you are always faithful to carry your beloved ones, regardless of how heavy our burden. Lord, help us to mourn well but to mourn with hope. Not a hope that wishes something to be true that is not true, but a confident hope in the truth of your scripture that one day, one day, you will send Jesus to return to earth and you will make all things right. Until that day, Lord, we need your help. We need your strength. 
I need your comfort. Father, we ask that you would, with your overflowing grace, goodness, and kindness, shower this precious family with your love. That they would rely on you for each and every day, sometimes for even just the next breath. Because that's the kind of good and faithful and trustworthy God that you are. Thank you so much for meeting with us. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. I have a couple notes to read for you. Here's a, a letter to our beautiful niece from Aunt Latoya and Uncle Brian. We were looking forward to meeting you in person, but we know that we will fly to meet you again one day. When we see your picture, we see how you are so beautiful and the fighter that you are. Yet still our hearts burst with joy at the mention of your name, Palia Joy Smith. We know you are in a good place. Aunt Latoya and Uncle Brian love you and see you later. I also have a note from Bernice. Thank you to our church and Harlan community. Thank you for your support during this difficult time. I am heartbroken because I was excited to be a dad. Thank you to both my family and my wife's family for your love and support as well. Please continue to keep us in your thoughts and your prayers. Let's read Psalm 23. A Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father, as we close this time in your word, we pray for continued grace, guidance, and strength in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing I'll Fly Away. <clears throat>
Christians are an amazing bunch of people to be able to sit and genuinely mourn and cry and sing truths of hope like that. I trust that you will go from here still sorrowing but uplifted as well. We're going to dismiss right now and uh, we have a fellowship uh, time ready in the fellowship hall. So just down the hallway, we encourage you all to stay um, have some snacks, have some food, and spend some time just encouraging each other as we, as we are able and as we have the time to today.